My name is Garrick Evans. I'm a software architect on the uh, Google Cloud Platform Solutions team. And I want to tell you, one of the coolest parts about my job is the opportunity that comes up once in a while to get involved with some projects that partners are doing, um, working on some very, very hard problems and asking some of the most intriguing and important questions of the world, in this particular case, the universe. Um, so today, I'm actually pleased to share with you one of these projects. It's the Atlas Experiment on Google Compute Engine. And with this project, what we wanted to demonstrate was actually tangible acceleration of scientific research by leveraging and taking advantage of Google's cloud and a particular compute engine. Uh, the computational and data demands of the Atlas experiment are pretty substantial. It's thousands of collaborators running as a baseline hundreds of thousands of jobs per day, um, peaking at over 10 times that amount. The experiment generates tens of petabytes of data a year, and there's currently well over 100 petabytes of data under management and coordination. So with me today are Dr. Sergey Panikin of the Brookhaven National Lab in New York and Andrew Hanashevsky of the SLAC National Accelerator Lab at Stanford. Sergey leads research and development of cloud computing at the Atlas Experiment at Large Hadron Collider, and we'll talk about the project itself, the compute clusters his team has assembled, and share his results with you. Andy's an information system specialist who's designed, <coughs> excuse me, and co-developed the data clustering technology, XRoot-D, which was used to federate data between Atlas and the cloud, and will provide us an overview of the technology. So with that, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Sergey Panitkin of Brookhaven National Lab. Today I will talk, oh, today I'll talk a little bit uh, about Atlas Experiment, Large Hadron Collider, um, Atlas Experiment Computing, the challenges of the uh, uh, big data experiment, our interest in clouds, and our recent project at Google Compute Engine, um, um, some computational clusters that we run on the grid and now running in the cloud. Um, and um, uh, we'll also describe the, the XRD technology, and you will go in more details about that. That's, we think, that there are products developed in the high energy community. Remember, World Wide Web. So there are new generation of technology developed in that community that we think they're open source and we think they're ready to be shared with people who are interested in clouds and large computational cluster and bridging virtual and real infrastructure, uh, things like that. Um, Atlas is the multipurpose detector at Large Hadron Collider at CERN. The Atlas experiment itself uh, is a large international collaboration of about uh, 3,000 scientists and engineers from many universities and labs around the globe. It took almost 20 years to design and build the apparatus, uh, but nevertheless, it's a very young collaboration with more than 1,200 graduate students working in Atlas and driving the analysis. Uh, this photo shows the outline of the LHC tunnel on an aerial view of countryside near Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, the LHC is one of the largest scientific instruments ever built, and certainly one of the most complex. And everything about LHC is, is extreme. Its size, its energy, its detectors. It's the coldest and emptiest place in the solar system. Uh, it's the hottest place in the universe with temperatures of particles created in the collision exceeding trillions degrees of Celsius. Uh, LHC tunnel is about 27 kilometers long. Thousands of superconducting magnets working at near absolute zero temperature are needed in order to accelerate and collide protons and heavy ions uh, at the highest energies ever achieved in the lab. Such energies are needed in order to explore the high energy frontier of modern particle physics to discover things like Higgs boson, the missing piece of the standard model, a particle that's responsible for electroweak symmetry breaking that generates mass of elementary particles. LHCs aim to explore physics beyond the standard model, things like supersymmetry, possible existence of extra dimensional, possible candidates of dark matter, dark energy, and, and whatever can be at that frontier. The Atlas detector is a multi-purpose apparatus designed to detect particles created in the collision of the LHC beams. It's the largest detector of its kind, and also one of the most complex. It's built like a Russian doll with detectors inside other detectors with several giant superconducting magnets. All of this is needed to accurately uh, 
register particle and identify them. It has very high granularity of sensing elements with about 150 millions of sensors of various kinds. And it's capable of taking snapshots of the collision events at the rate of 40 megahertz, or every 25 nanoseconds. And it weighs about 7,000 tons, and it's quite large in size. This slide gives you a feeling of the size of the ATLAS detector. Here, outlines of ATLAS and our sister detector, CMS, are superimposed with the image of the ATLAS and CMS six-story office building at CERN. And ATLAS is taller than that building. It's a huge apparatus. Uh, the detector itself sits in the LHC tunnel about 100 meters below the surface, and it was assembled there piece by piece, carefully like a ship in the bottle. Quite extraordinary engineering achievement, especially taking into account that the detector should be able to measure particle positions with the accuracy exceeding 100 microns. So it should be assembled with a very high precision. And that's how it looks fully assembled in the cover. Um, as I mentioned before, LHC and ATLAS were built to explore high energy frontier of modern particle physics, to search for new phenomena that may occur at these energies, to probe the very fundamental laws of nature. In particular, to search for Higgs boson, this missing piece of standard model of elementary particles responsible for electric symmetry break and again generation of masses of other elementary particles. And Higgs mechanism was suggested about 40 years ago and since then physicists around the world were searching for proof of its existence. And recent discovery of a new particle at LHC which looks like Higgs boson culminates the searches. Less than a year ago, two experiments at LHC, Atlas, and CMS announced the discovery of the new particle. It was called a giant leap for science, the most important discovery of the last decade in the particle physics. It generated a lot of public interest and a lot of media attention with thousands and thousands of print stories and TV spots. And most likely you have heard about this discovery already. Uh, but you probably haven't seen my next slide. Uh, I must note here, that typically uh, we do not detect elementary particles like Higgs directly. Uh, like many other subatomic particles, Higgs is too heavy, too unstable, uh, and too short-lived. When produced, it immediately decays into lighter, more stable, more long-lived particles that are actually registered by our detectors like Atlas. And by the way, such decays may be multi-staged, and one unstable object decaying in the other, and then on the after several of such decays, you're getting final state particles. By using uh, collected information about decayed products of Higgs, uh, what we call the final state particles, we can nevertheless prove existence of parent particles like Higgs. Indirectly, yes, but, but without any doubt. Just by using simple laws of conservation of energy and momentum familiar from freshman physics 101. Um, whatever energy existed before the particle decay should be conserved after the decay and mass equivalent to energy as was pointed out by Einstein and mass of the decaying parent particle doesn't disappear. It transforms to masses and momentum of the decay product, the daughter particles. So again, by using the information collected about final state particles, we can reconstruct the mass of the parent particle and we measure many events for each event, take all final state particles that belong to a particular decay channel. We calculate effective mass of such combination and plotting a histogram, a histogram of effective mass. And eventually, you expect to see a peak in that histogram that corresponds to the mass of the parent particle. Of course, there may be, there may be other particles that decay uh, into the same final state, and you will see a spectrum, a distribution, and, uh, but there should be a peak corresponding to the mass of the particle you search for. There will be noise, but if particle exists, there will be a signal, simply because of conservation of energy and momentum. And on this slide, you can see how the discovery of the Higgs boson uh, unfolded. Here, you're looking at the spectrum of effective mass of four leptons detected by Atlas. Decaying to four leptons is one of the predicted decay channels for the Higgs boson. And as we were collecting more and more data the peak at 125 GeV, and GeV is a unit of mass used in high energy physics, just kept growing. 
indicating that there is a new particle, very heavy, never seen before, clear and beautiful peak. And of course, you do search in many different decay channels. Higgs can decay into anything that is not forbidden by conservation laws. In one event, it can decay into gamma quants, in another, into four leptons, and so forth. And some events may have no Higgs in there. Uh, but it's the same Higgs, so in every decay channel, you should expect a peak at the same place, at the same mass. And these are various decay channels, and you see the clear indication that there is something at 125 GeV. Now, let's talk about data challenges of such analysis. Particles that we want to discover and study are rare. That's why LHC runs at such high energy and with such intense beams, almost a billion interactions per second. Even in this condition, the probability to create Higgs boson is tiny. You would need to search for one Higgs in more than a trillion event. And at high beam densities, multiple collision can occur in one beam crossing. This plot shows uh, how such event looks like. It's quite messy. That explains why you need such a big detector, such high granularity, such strong magnetic field, so many channels of sensors, so many channels of electronics, uh, because you are searching in something for something very rare. And that's probably for Google people, you know, Google developers, that's a familiar uh, problem. Your selectivity should be very, very high, like one in several trillions. It's like looking for one person in a thousand the world population of one needle at 20 million haystack. ATLAS is quintessential big data experiment. Um, ATLAS detector generates about one petabyte per second of raw data. Most of it, no one can store it, even Google. Most are filtered out in real time by the trigger system. Interesting events are uh, recorded for further reconstruction analysis. And as of this year, we're managing about 140 petabytes of data worldwide. Um, and that's distributed over 100 computing centers. And that's actually not only raw data, but the derived formats, the simulation, about 50% of our data. It's the Monte Carlo simulation of various proper properties, simulation of how the particle propagates the detector, digitization, things like that. And we expect that this data rate will be only growing after uh, LHC large shutdown, which is happening now in 2014. The data rate will be higher. The energy of collision will be higher. We expect the influx of already filtered data on the level of 40 petabytes uh, per year. And we have to deliver this data to thousands of physicists worldwide. Now a little bit about Atlas computing. Atlas uses grid computing paradigm for organization of distributed resources. Job distribution is managed by Panda workload management system. Panda stands for production and analysis. Think of it as grid metascheduler. Panda was developed by Atlas, and now it manages distribution of computing jobs for hundreds of computing sites, about 100,000 cores, 100 million jobs per year, and serving thousands of users. Organizationally, the grid is set up in the tiered system highly hierarchical with a tier zero center located at CERN. Tier zero center um, receives the raw data from the Atlas detector, performs first pass analysis, and then distributes it among other tiers. Uh, tier one is typically national-based large centers, one of them at the Brookhaven lab. Uh, and each tier one facility then distributes derived data to tier two computing facilities that provides data storage and processing capabilities for more in-depth and user analysis. This plot shows the distribution of running jobs, both Monte Carlo simulation, we call them production jobs, on the Atlas grid and, and analysis jobs on the Atlas grid for the past year. We run on about 100,000 cores worldwide, processing about 150,000 jobs per day. It's clear that all available computational resources are fully stressed and utilized. And on this plot, you see the distribution of pending jobs, submitted but wait, waiting for execution on Atlas Grid for the past year. You can see that the job submission pattern is very uneven in time. Spikes in demand usually happen before major physics conference or during data reprocessing. And demand can exceed available computational resources by more than an order of magnitude. Lack of resources shows, slows down pace of scientific discovery, and that's why Atlas is interested in cloud computing and in particular in public cloud resources. 
A couple of years ago, Atlas set up cloud computing R&D project to explore virtualization and cloud computing, primarily as a tool to cope with peak loads on the grid. We wanted to learn how to use public and private clouds in typical Atlas computational scenarios. Since then, we gained experience with many cloud platforms like Amazon EC2, Helix, Nebula, consortium of European cloud providers, Future Grid, Cinefo, Academic Clouds in US and Canada, and many others. We we'll also explore private and hybrid cloud configuration uh, based on OpenStack, Cloud Stack, Open Nebula, and others. And our latest project was on Google Compute Engine, and I'll talk about it now in details. We were invited to participate in Google Compute Engine trial period in August 2012, and we were immediately attracted by modern hardware, powerful API, and competitive pricing. And this is Google, after all. At the beginning, we were frustrated that none of the tools that we were used before supported Google Compute Engine. So initially, a lot of manual labor and image building and cluster management was needed since we couldn't reuse our standard tools. We are glad to see here at Google I.O. that this situation is changing and many tools are supporting uh, Google Compute Engine now. But Google engineers were very helpful in, in, in helping us with initial setup and in debugging the problems and explaining to us features of the Google Cloud Platform implementation. And also, Google was very gracious in providing more resources than the initial trial quarter so we could start working on the larger scale clusters. We wanted to try several of Atlas computational scenarios, high performance analysis clusters like Proof, we wanted to learn about storage and data management on the cloud, in particular, utilize X3D technology for storage aggregation, ephemeral storage aggregation, and federation. We also wanted to try large-scale Monte Carlo production simulation on the cloud using Panda workload management system, as, as well as some other smaller projects. So let me talk about Panda BHQ on Google Compute Engine. Google agreed to allocate additional resources for Atlas um, at the tune of about 5 million core hours. Uh, resources uh, um, were organized as HT Condor uh, Panda queue, and that allows for transparent inclusion of the cloud resource into Atlas computational grid. Google Compute Engine looks as a part of the Atlas grid, just like another grid site. Very transparent. It was intended to run CPU-intensive Monte Carlo simulation, and the idea was to try to have a production type of the run on Google Compute Engine, and the system was delivered to Atlas as a production resource, not as R&D platform. We ran for about eight weeks. Two weeks were planned for startup, and we had very stable uh, running. Uh, the Google Compute Engine was rock solid. We had a few problems, and most of them were at the Atlas site. We ran computationally intensive job, not much I.O. for this particular workload. Um, these were physics of engine generators, fast detector simulation, full detector simulation. Uh, produced data were automatically shipped to Atlas grid storage for further processing and analysis. That was real usable data. Uh, we completed about 450,000 jobs, generated and uh, processed about uh, more than 200 million events. Very good performance, very comparable to performance on Atlas grid. This plot shows the job failure rate as a function of time. Most failures occur during startup and scale-up period as we expected. Uh, most problems were actually on the Atlas side. No failures were due to the Google Compute Engine, very stable performance of the platform. This plot shows distribution of finished and failed jobs, green histograms for finished jobs, the pink one for failed one. Again, very good performance. We reach high rates of production, 50,000 jobs per day, a good number. Uh, we also tried proof clusters, and proof is an implementation of MapReduce paradigm based on the root framework. Root framework for uh, data analysis was developed by high energy and nuclear physics community, um, developed support by the root team at CERN. It's written in C++, free, open source, very high performance. I will have a slide with the pointers to the system. Um, and proof allows for efficient aggregation and use of distributed computing resources for data intensive event-based analysis. It uses X3D for clustering, storage aggregation, and data discovery. Xroot is well suited for ephemeral storage aggregation into one name space. Um, and uh, proof cluster also can be federated. So on this slide, you can see sort of typical architecture of the proof clusters with a supermaster, uh, which is serves as a user single point of entry. System complexity is completely hidden from users. Um, 
And it allows, for, for example, for interactive analysis where you can send a query and in real time see how the particular histogram just grows or changes. One of the distinctive features. But it also allows batch analysis and you can connect to the system, look at the histogram, disconnect, then connect again, look again, see how it's going. Um, and here is another view of the typical structure of the proof cluster. Proof, as I mentioned, works very well with X3D based storage. X3D provides data discovery and helps proof exploit this data locality where possible. Access to Google Compute Engine allows us to build and test large proof clusters up to 1,000 workers, something that is very difficult to do in real domain. We just don't have free resources and to, to do this kind of you know, test and, and see how it all scales. And the figure here shows scalability test for 500 worker cluster, um, and it shows very good performance and pretty good scalability. We also look at the storage performance um, of Google Compute Engine, and this plot shows the uh, performance in the typical um, Atlas analysis scenario uh, of ephemeral store, persistent store, and here compared to uh, what happened if you have all the data in the memory. And note that the ephemeral disk has better single worker performance, but the persistent uh, storage shows better scaling and better peak performance. And of course, uh, in this situation, it's clear that the rate is needed for better performance. We also look at the data transfer uh, capabilities, and this plot shows the data transfer from our own federated Atlas X root to Google Compute Engine in uh, extreme copy mode, which is sort of similar to BitTorrent. If you have several copies, you can copy them in multi-source, multi-stream mode. And uh, Google Compute Engine XRoot cluster using ephemeral storage uh, was used for this test, and average transfer rate was about 60 uh, megabyte per second. And this is very good taken into account that this is over completely unmanaged uh, public networks. You have no control there. But still, and, and this is single client performance. Many of the plots that I'm showing, they're single uh, client because the system that we're running, they scale very well when you add resources. So you expect sort of close to linear scaling up. So what they are really interesting is how the building blocks uh, are running. And here is single client, but you can run on multiple VMs, multiple clients simultaneously and stream them over. And we're also thinking about dedicated network peering between uh, Atlas networking infrastructure and, and, and Google storage. So that's kind of that will give us much higher 100 gigabit per second performance and we would be able to, to, to control it and, and, and do manageable transfers. But this is just if you just want to run and bring your data in, it's doable. And uh, now we'll talk about XRoot, this clustering and storage clustering technology that Andy was a creator and a driving force behind this project and still is. And Andy, please. How was it? So I want to take a quick trip through uh, a bit of technology we developed uh, a while back, but wound up being absolutely uh, an ideal match with the Google Compute Engine. And that's XRoot-D, and you say, never heard of it. Well, it's a system for scalable cluster data access. And you say, that's nice, what is it really? Well, what we have is an implementation of two services. One, an extra service that provides access to data. So you would take one of these daemons and drop it on every node where you have data that you need to access. Now, there's a companion service. It's called CMSD, stands for Cluster Management Services, and that's used for data discovery as well as routing clients to where the data is and server clustering. So normally, uh, these are separate, but we normally use them together, and so for the purposes of this talk, uh, we'll always talk about this particular pair. Now, I want to emphasize that this system is not a file system. People are actually using the system to cluster existing file systems. So we have people uh, basically taking HDFS, GPFS, Luster, and building one big giant cluster out of that and having uniform data access. Uh, so while it's not a file system, it's also not just for file systems. Uh, we have an experiment that's using this as a framework to cluster uh, MySQL tables across hundreds of MySQL servers so they can do massively parallel uh, queries. 
So the idea is that if we don't have a plugin for your data, and you can write a plugin for your data, then you can cluster it. And so I'd like to show you what that plugin architecture looks like. Uh, first, we start off with a protocol driver. You can plug in any number of protocols into that driver. In our particular case, we want to do XRoot. So let's take a look as we plug stuff together. So plug in your protocol, plug in your authentication framework, plug in your logical file system, your authorization framework, your storage system, and then your clustering. And all of a sudden, you've built up a clustering system for a particular kind of application. So let's get back to what the data access problem is. Uh, it's the high energy physics regime. Yeah, they do nasty things, like uh, start up thousands of parallel jobs. And they all start up pretty much at the same time. And if that weren't bad enough, each one of those opens 10 or more files. Uh, pretty much a profile of a denial service attack, if you ask me. Uh, but uh, basically, you have to handle that. Uh, to make matters worse, the particular framework that they use is small block, sparse random IO. What do we mean by small block? Average read size, about 4K. What do we mean by sparse? Well, <clears throat> they have like a 10 gigabyte file, and you'll be lucky if they read half of it randomly. So pretty challenging. So uh, we adopted a synergistic solution to try to attack this problem. And you'll see what we mean by synergy here. First, we wanted to minimize the latency. And the key elements there were using a paralyzable protocol, file sessions, uh, a sticky thread model, and lockless I.O. Next, we wanted to minimize hardware requirements, so short code paths, compact data structures, members that are cognizant of what the, the uh, memory cache is, so it's friendly to the memory cache. Uh, we don't actually move data around in the server and we don't do cross-thread data sharing. So in the end, we wind up with less than seven microseconds overhead on a two gigahertz CPU per I.O. request, uh, and less than 100 megabyte memory footprint. So pretty compact. Now those two are synergistic uh, in the sense that if you minimize latency, you'll see opportunities to minimize hardware requirements. And if you start minimizing hardware requirements, you see opportunities to minimize latency. The next thing we wanted to do was minimize human cost. So what does that mean? Well, for us, that meant a single configuration file, no database requirement. Uh, you can add and delete nodes at will. We don't care. You don't have to restart anything. You just add stuff and delete stuff. And you use your natural file system uh, administration tools to administer this thing uh, because that's what you know. Now, that together, <clears throat> we wanted to maximize scaling. And those two are actually synergistic. You can't maximize scaling unless you minimize the human cost. And you see immediately opportunities between those two as you attack both of those problems. So let's talk about scaling. We use B64 trees for scaling. And we'll basically scale this using this pair, X root DCMS. So let's start out with a single node. And then what we'll do is we'll add 64 data servers to that node. Um, gee, looks like a really dinky cluster, doesn't it? So what we do, it's a B64 tree. Well, we'll add 64 data servers to each one of those 64 nodes. Well, now we have a cluster of 4,096. Mm, decent, but not very big. We can just repeat the step. And now we've accomplished a cluster of 262,000 servers. Well, that looks big, but what if we iterate one more time? Now we've constructed a cluster of 16 million data servers. And you look at that and say, hmm, that looks like a house of cards. Well, not really, because we can replicate the head node, geographically distribute it, and now we have quite a bit of redundancy in the system. So let's add some names to these things. Uh, the head node is the manager. Intermediate nodes are supervisors, and data servers always are at the leaf nodes. So remember that. Now, this is a B tree. We can split it up any way we want. And this was great for basically doing cloud deployment, because in fact, part of that tree can be inside the GCE, another part can be in a private cloud, another part in a private cluster, 
and we can piece that all together to make it look like one big cluster. Now you look at that and say, great, but I have 16 million nodes. How do I get to the data? I can't keep track of 16 million things. Well, in fact, let's take a look at how we do it. So when you get a big cluster like this, you really have to adopt a brand new strategy. So we have a client. He gets an open or does an open to the head node. And here we're going to assume that the head node knows nothing about the file the client needs. So what does it have to do? It has to find the route to the file. And it'll accomplish that by just doing a directed broadcast parallel query. And that'll set up the routing tables in this tree. After that, the head node can then redirect the client to the next subtree. That subtree, in turn, redirects the client to the leaf node. Now, this is the only scalable way of doing it, because you don't have to keep track of anything but the immediate route, pretty much in how the internet works. So the bottom line here is a simple, flexible, and effective system. Uh, I want to say it's simple, but the devil is in the details. Uh, we have a paper we presented in IPDS uh, that'll give you some of the algorithms we have to use. Uh, <clears throat> and you can actually get the paper at xrootd.org. Uh, it's LGPL, open source. You can download it, run it. It's managed by the XRootD collaboration. That collaboration is open to new members. And I do uh, you know, encourage you to go to xrootd.org. So now, Sergey, finish it up. And uh, let me summarize. All in all, we had great experience with Google Compute Engine. We tested several computational scenarios on that platform, proof XRD clusters, Panda Batch clusters, and ran large-scale Monte Carlo production. And we think that Google Compute Engine is modern cloud infrastructure that can serve as a stable, high-performance platform for scientific computing. And tools developed by the LHC community may be of some interest to a broader community of developers working on Google Compute Engine and other compute engine. And thank you very much. OK, thanks a lot. <clears throat> uh, so we're done. And we'd uh, be happy to take any questions that you guys have at the time. Please come up to the mics. Oh. OK, well, thanks. Hope you had a great I.O. <laughs> Thank you.